<clears throat> okay, everyone. Um, as Mike mentioned, if you were just listening, we do have 6.30. We're going to start right on time as published and scheduled. Um, want to make sure we're all in here at the right session as we've had several webinars over the last week or two. Um, so this is the 2022 Special Mix Maryland 10 pin bowling preseason webinar. Um, this is basically to talk about the season and bowling stuff. This isn't necessarily anything about the state championships, or regionals, although we will make mention of that in several locations throughout the, the webinar this evening. Um, with us tonight, we do have Mike Sarnowski, our VP of Sports. Uh, my name is Steve Bennett. I'm the Senior Director with Competitions in the Community Program. And Rich Domros, our Bowling Sport Management Team and one of our head officials for the state tournament and regionals. And um, just a uh, also providing some coaches trainings for us through the season. So I um, wanted to recognize those individuals. And again, as you saw, this uh, uh, webinar is being recorded this evening. Um, if you could hold off to questions to the end, or you can chat those in the chat function of the webinar, and we will be monitoring those throughout the, the session this evening and answering those as appropriately, or whether it's at a time specific for that, or we may stop the webinar and address it for everyone. Um, so with that being said, um, we'll go ahead and get started here. And boom. So here's kind of the topics we're gonna to hit on this evening. Uh, again, welcome everyone. So topic number one has concluded. Um, topic number two is some updates in regards to COVID and what our current protocols are moving forward, where there have been some changes. Um, some of you who may be involved in other fall sports, um, you may be aware of that because we also address those in those webinars um, uh, most recently. Uh, we'll talk about the registration and deadlines and paperwork and certifications and the requirements and all of that, um, with that also being um, not just for um, all the partners and athletes and everything, but then we'll also give some reminders about the requirements for um, coaches and other volunteers within the program. We'll talk about the regionals and the state championship. And then um, we'll talk about um, some rule reminders and updates with that. Um, and then we'll have some question and answers at the end, or like I said, we may address those throughout the webinar. So again, um, thank you so much. At the very end, um, after we do a thank you, there are some resource slides that we're not going to go in through um, this evening, but they will be on here um, for your reference. And once we get the recording published and the slide deck um, finalized, we'll post that on our coaches resource and send that out to you, um, hopefully within a day, but I want to be realistic with our kayaking championship or kayaking time trials this weekend. It may be postponed till Monday but we'll do our best to get those out to you over the weekend. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And I will now also like to recognize some of our bowling management team members. Um, Rich, we've already talked about, we have Rob Wright, who continues, although St. Mary's does not have a bowling program, he continues to be involved with the sport. Uh, Franco from Howard County and Mike Ward, also from Howard County. Um, Ryan Leverty from uh, Montgomery County as an athlete rep. Jackie Sewell, who hopefully everyone knows at some form or fashion, who's our host for the state championships at Bowl America in Gaithersburg, and Don Furlow, who's also a member of our games management team. So with that being said, I will now turn it over to Mr. Sarnowski so he can give you some updates on uh, new updated uh, protocol and information regarding COVID. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, as I'm sure everyone knows, uh, the whole situation with COVID has been very dynamic and, and uh fluid and such. And uh, hopefully everyone uh, received the um, uh, the update email that I sent out, uh, it might be about a month ago now, um, uh, or at least uh, several weeks ago, that gave you an update on things. So in the spring um, of this year, uh, we shifted our protocol uh, at uh, our various, uh, not only our events, but our training programs, which apply to your programs that um, we would not be following the, the various um, uh, requirements or protocols that are put forward by Special Olympics, but would be following what the CDC recommendations were. Um, and so at trainings and such, there, um, uh, it, uh, we, did, we weren't worried so much or tracking so much in terms of what the percentage of um, uh, incidents in the community was and so on down the line, basically, uh, if uh, uh, the state of Maryland 
or your county or the facility, whatever the particular uh, requirements were or status was uh, for that, whichever was the most restrictive is what you would follow. Um, uh, and that uh, worked pretty well for the spring programs and we're continuing them uh, through uh, the fall now and going forward with that. We did leave a few things in place. However, now uh, over the, uh, the summer, a few weeks ago, uh, maybe a month ago, uh, we made the decision um, with our uh, feedback from our Athlete Leadership Council, from our uh, area leaders, coaches, staff, legal counsel, and most importantly, our Return to Play Task Force, which is a group of folks, including coaches, athletes, um, uh, area directors, uh, and such, um, who have been looking at and, and looking at what our protocol should be. And the decision was made at that time uh, that a, we would continue with, um, you know, following whatever uh, state, local, or facility uh, requirements there were, but we would remove the vaccination requirement um, through the um, through the bowling season, um, and then we'll reevaluate it for later in the year, um, uh, for the spring and for winter and such uh, at a at a later time, assuming we want to make sure everything's going fine. So what that means is that the, uh, uh, there is no vaccination requirement to participate in 10-pin uh, bowling or for um, uh, the other sports, the powerlifting, uh, soccer, and flag football, I think were the other ones that were impacted by that um, uh, for the fall season. In addition, there is no requirement uh, for vaccination uh, for overnight stays. I don't know that that really applies that much here for bowling, uh, but it does apply for some other sports um, uh, and such. So that's not there anymore either. In addition, um, we'll follow the CDC recommendations, which we'll see on the next slide, of uh, how folks would return to participating uh, after a positive test. It had been a requirement that you had to have a negative test uh, or a written clearance from a physician. Um, that's uh, not something that we will uh, require now. Um, whatever the standard is at that time for CDC, we'll follow. Uh, and then again, we'll we'll reevaluate for the um, uh, for the spring or for the winter and spring seasons, uh, probably in a November timeframe. Since I know many of the folks on the call uh, coach other sports as well. Um, of course, this is all the at this time. Should anything dramatic change, we don't anticipate it. Uh, but it, should anything dramatic change, then we would uh, look at uh, potentially reevaluating this. But we're pretty comfortable, comfortable and confident that this is the right way to go. Steve, you can give us the next slide. Yeah, um, one thing I do want to point out as well, and I'm sorry if you already hit this, Mike, I didn't hear you say it. Um, although we're not requiring vaccinations, um, if you have the forms, um, we're still accepting those to put in our database and tracking who's vaccinated and who's not, um, just for in case something changes in the future where that comes back into play. So um, again, it's not a requirement to submit them, but we are definitely still um, receiving those. Okay. Um, and we also know that this change uh, is not something necessarily that everybody is in agreement with, uh, but we do think it's the best uh, move forward uh, for us here. So again, you have the link there for the CDC site. Uh, the gist of it is now, if and this is if you've tested positive uh, as of, uh, what was that, yesterday or two days ago, uh, I double checked it and it's still this uh, standard here. Um, stay at home for at least five days. Uh, and then um, uh, you can start coming out uh, if you no longer have a fever uh, for 24 uh, for 24 hours. Uh, and um, of course, wearing a mask. Mike, Mike, um, you, you froze. Um, you, you froze right after you said 24 hours um, and then you froze for about 15 seconds there. Oh, I'm sorry. OK, thank you. Um, uh, courtesy. Well, I, I won't mention my. Uh, my internet provider. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, there have been a few issues with that. Uh, but anyhow, so yeah, um, so you can see them here. This is what it, this, the requirement is now. We're not going to go into this in detail. If you do have a um, uh, experience where you need to, to address this for any athlete or volunteer or uh, um, coach or a family member for that matter, um, you, know, you can contact your area director, uh, he or she. Uh, is very knowledgeable along these lines, and they can tap into the resources necessary to get you additional information should you need it. And I think we have one more slide on this general topic. 
Oh yeah, it's just recognizing that um, you know there's going to be different opinions on um, whether we should be rolling back the vaccination requirement or not. Um, and we understand that we're not going to go into that or have that conversation now. It is the decision that's been made uh, for this time. Uh, but um, we do think it's the best situation uh, for us uh, at this point moving forward. And we'll, of course, keep uh, monitoring it and um, uh, be uh, uh, looking if we need to shift anything. So I think with that, Steve, uh, I can toss it back to you. Very good. Thank you, Mike. I uh, appreciate that. Um, if, if you have been with Special Mix Maryland within a couple months, hopefully you've seen this or have been told about this. This is something we remind everybody. So as you look to have your practice sessions begin, training sessions begin, um, gatherings with your bowling teams, whatever, um, always good to, well, not always good, you must make sure that anyone before they have a first practice session or training session or whatever, that no athlete or volunteer can participate without the valid forms. Uh, for the athletes, that is their medical form and their communicable disease waiver or the CDW and the volunteer application for volunteers and other um, necessary requirements as needed for the other individuals. But um, again, no exceptions to this. Um, before you have your first practice session, check with the area leadership. You can also check on our coaches resource page to see um, certain certifications and things available or that are needed. Uh, but always check with the area leadership. And again, don't let anyone come to the first practice and start without those things in place. Um, just again, always work with the area leadership, um, similar to the certifications and forms that they're aware of and can help you with, as well as the COVID protocol stuff if you have questions. Um, they're a great resource for all, the, all you guys as coaches. Um, again, as you start your programs, just work with them and make sure that you have everything you need and you're in compliance and everybody in your bowling program is in compliance of, of what's required to, to get started, to have a have a, a great, good start to the season and set the stage for a successful year of bowling. This is kind of, we have several grids, so there shouldn't be any reason um, why you have confusion on this. So this is just um, one grid that we share with you guys in regards to what's required for each of the participants um, that would be uh, potentially uh, participating in the bowling program or other programs. So as we talked about your athletes, obviously the medical form and the CDW, communicable disease waiver. Um, you see everybody on this list must have the CDW, no exceptions. Um, for unified partners and general volunteers, it's the background check, protective behaviors and the CDW. Sports volunteers, then you add the concussion um, certification. On this slide, when we say under assistant coaches and head coaches, assistant coach sports certification and head coach sports certification, that doesn't mean if you have everything on this list that you are certified. There's another slide that goes in a little bit more detail, but both of those coaches need to have the coaching Special Olympics athletes, or in some rare cases, a, just the coaching unified sports certification or course, and then also the head coach for the sports specific training that Rich is conducting here in a week or two. Okay, so again, this is just a reference slide for you. This is also located on our coaches resource page that has a link down there um, as a reference. So when we get to deadlines and timelines, again, don't write out, you don't need to write all this down. We'll send this slide deck out to you. Um, we have the training registration, we have the missing forms uh, dates and the competition registration. Now with this being said, if you look in the middle column of when, the dates I'm going to give you are when it is due to the state office. That is not when you are to give them to your area leadership. Work with them, as we mentioned earlier. They usually need it a week or two prior to the deadlines that you see on this screen so that they can look it over, make sure they're valid and good to go, and then get them submitted to us so that we can um, update them in the system. So with that being said, um, to the state office, the training registration deadline is September 30th. Um, as a reminder, the training registration is anyone who is in your bowling program um, has to be in by that date in order to be eligible to continue on to the state championships and regionals. However, um, if someone does join after that date, that's fine. They can continue to practice and train and have the camaraderie and learn the sport. They just won't be eligible to move on. Uh, they can enjoy the sport, have the practice, have, make the friends, learn the sport, all of that good stuff, okay? On the 10th of October, 
once you have everyone into the system and the training registration, we'll be doing a look over and seeing what is missed, um, what's missing according to our records. If you've done your job, which I know each and every one of you will have or in, and will do your job, make sure everybody's in compliance. However, sometimes a certain form may not have made it to the state office, although you may have it at the local level or the county level, we just may not have received it. So um, we'll give you some reports on that, working with your area directors um, and let them know um, leading up to the 10th. Um, but if there are any missing forms from our records, they have to be to us by that time. So again, a week or two prior to that, um, you'll be looking to your area directors to make sure everything's good to go. With those forms, um, we need to make sure with uh, like athlete medicals, coaches certifications, et cetera, um, that everything is valid through December 4th. So, you know, we, we always have some athletes here and there whose medical expires during the season. So at the beginning of the season, yeah, it's good. Oh, crap. They need to get a renewal medical form in the next week. So really take a close look at those medical forms and other expirations um, when you get your um, stuff in place at the beginning of the season. Um, and then also we have the competition registration deadline um, for the regionals. That's on October 24th. And the state championships, that is on November 23rd. So again, um, that's where all of your events and all of your uh, averages, your 15 game averages will be entered, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so again, just make note of those. Again, you'll have these uh, dates um, when we send it out. This is just another kind of spreadsheet, if you will, um, laying all of that out, okay? Um, so again, kind of the, the only thing that's really added on here, I think, is the November 30th, that's the uh, uh, finals pre-competition webinar. November 2nd is the regional competition webinar. And what we do need from you guys, this is coming up pretty soon. August 19th is when we are looking to have an initial estimate of how many bowlers from your county program are looking to attend the regionals and potentially make it to the finals. The reason for that is we need those numbers. And if you have to guesstimate, guesstimate a little bit high versus low so that um, we use that information to start planning of where different county programs will go during the regional competitions um, because uh, house capacities and lane capacities and all of that, okay? So really make a note of that. Um, you can send that um, directly to me. Um, and um, actually, Steve, we'll have a survey. That's okay. So uh, thank you for the clarification on that, Mike. I was yep. struggling or pausing there for a minute, hoping um, you could save me on that one. So yeah, we'll send a survey out to you guys as coaches. And again, um, it will probably say how many athletes, how many partners, and then how many coaches or assistant volunteers from your program will be attending. Okay. Very good. Thank you guys for that. And again, just make a note of that. That's coming up soon. So as we talked about um, what the coaches need, et cetera, um, and, and others need for this, this is kind of a layout, the class A, we talked about all that, but this is about the fourth or fifth bullet point down. That's where the coaching Special Olympics athlete course is needed for both assistant coaches and head coaches. Um, and again, if there is someone who only coaches unified sports, which in bowling, I don't think anybody would be in that situation, but in other sports, if they, you know, if you coach unified flag football or soccer or whatever moving forward, that's another course that you could take um, and is, is very valuable as well. <clears throat> like I said, for head coaches, they also need to have the sports certification, which again, Rich has graciously been um, um, offered to do uh, for us this year as well. So again, just make, make check of everything you need. Again, once, once again, another, another form, from our friend Janet Laramore from Howard County put this together, um, kind of lays it out uh, in another format. The only thing I'll, I will make note is advanced coach. Um, that is for individuals who look to go past the state level of coaching. So for USA games, for world games, for the invitationals, the national invitationals, that type of thing. Um, those coaches need to have the principles of coaching course for the POC and I think I was getting a little echo there, but thanks for checking on that, Mike. Um, it's a great course to take. 
um, regardless of your education level as a coach, um, but just to know that that's not required at the state level, but again, um, a phenomenal course to take to continue your coach education. So qualifying for the state tournament, um, must have a 15 game average. I've had one or two coaches ask, um, are we gonna continue with the 10 game or the 15 game, whatever? So we are going back to the 15 game average. Um, during the COVID with the challenges of lanes and facilities, we, we did adjust that to 10 games, but we're now back to the 15 game average. Um, so if there are major concerns that you have uh, for obtaining that, let me know and we can have a talk offline, but um, this is what we need. Again, no promises, but if you have struggles, as always, we'll address the issue and see what, uh, what, how, we, how we can come to a final conclusion there. Um, so again, that 15 game average should be from this season, um, not five games from this year and 10 games from 2021. Um, so again, we wanna have the current uh, averages for all the athletes there. Um, and that could be from practices. If athletes are in other tournaments or other leagues, you could use some of those as well. Um, so again, we need that 15 game average. Um, for the state tournament, once again, um, they must compete at the regional um, tournaments and then must be selected to advance from the regionals to the state. Um, depending on um, attendance and quantity of athletes and partners, um, we'll take pretty much all the gold medalists from the regionals, and then we'll go to silver medalists to fill the spots if need be. Um, and again, you know, if there's any issues with COVID comes up um, that aren't currently in place, we'll communicate that out if there's any significant changes. Um, but again, it's kind of the random draw process after we uh, put all the gold medalists in, then we look for the silver medalists and so on there will be a wait list or an alternate list. Um, but we're looking to do that draw or that selection, if you will, um, the Tuesday after the regional tournaments to give that out to you guys to make sure that those um, who have been selected um, will actually look to attend the finals so that if they're not, we can um, open that up to other athletes. So again, qualifying for the state, continuing on that, on that uh, topic, um, obviously you have to have all your paperwork and meet all the deadlines and registration requirements um and have your certifications in place and we talked about the 15 game average in competing at the regional tournament so this right here is the tentative initial assignments as we mentioned earlier um, the deadline coming up uh, with you giving us your initial guesstimate of how many participants from your county programs will um will attend the regionals this is kind of our guesstimate right now now this could change a little bit that's why it's tentative, right? Um, but one thing I do want to point out is that the lanes in Frederick County are no longer in operation. So the big thing to note there is uh, Cumberland will be our new facility for Western Maryland. Um, Allegheny, Carroll, Frederick, Garrett, and Washington counties. At this time, that's kind of our guess of which counties will participate there. The other thing to make note of here is in Gaithersburg, regardless of where your county overall is going to be assigned, all doubles, traditional, unified, whatever, will be participating at Gaithersburg, okay? And that's at the regionals. They re and if they make it to finals there too, because that's the host for finals, okay? Um, and again, the regionals are on November 13th. If you haven't seen that uh, date, uh, make a note of that. Um, and again, you know, if anything comes up and we need to make changes, uh, uh, we'll do so um, as we move forward, but uh, we were very happy to have some good conversations with our, our friends in Cumberland and make a new contact up there. Steve, we have a question from Tony. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Tony. Hey, Steve, here, here's a question. Okay. Um, say that a team, does the coach have to, for example, for double, since it's going to all be at Gaithersburg and there are other bowlers maybe someplace else does the coach definitely have to be how are they going to be at both sites at once yeah and that's where if you only have one coach and you're not assigned to gaithersburg and you have doubles you need to get yourself another assistant coach okay okay 
And if you have any any challenges and issues with that, Tony, let me know. We can talk to you through that. But the good point is, yeah, um, you know, we have the coaches packets. If there's a protest or if there's issues with the team or whatever, um, anybody sending a unified team to Gaithersburg that's not already going there with the rest of their delegation must have another person as a coach in that position. Okay. Thanks. You bet. Thanks, Tony. Good question. Yeah. And again, as we, we mentioned at the, the end here, um, we're looking to finalize those locations on the 28th of October. But again, this is kind of our tentative guess at this time, and we'll adjust accordingly based on the numbers you guys provide through the survey that we'll send out to you. Here's here's one thing we we I know me personally, um, it was easier to manage and um, walk around and find people. Um, last year at the state and regional tournaments when we did not allow spectators. Um, we're not saying we're not going to allow spectators. Um, however, we are looking at the possibility of having a reduction at least of spectators for several reasons. One, it's capacity issues. Um, it's the safety of the venue. We also noticed, I don't know if you guys as coaches, I'm sure you did, in some cases, there was a lot less stress on the athletes. Um, confusion and interruptions and just you know, some family members are great, some are more involved than others. And, you know, it's it's a dynamic of families at any um, sports organization, not just Special Olympics. So we're going to continue to look at that. Um, but just know that there is a uh, likelihood that there will be a reduction of spectators at both the regionals and finals. Don't know exactly what that is. We're still talking through that with some, uh, some of our teams. Um, it may be one or two um, spectators per athlete, maybe one. We don't know that yet. We are just letting you know to let your families and other people know that most likely there will be a reduction in the numbers and a restriction on how many spectators will be allowed into the venue. If you have questions on that, um, definitely um, email me if you have suggestions, if you're Want to give me your uh, thoughts, both positive pros or cons? Let me know that as well. We'll take that into consideration. And then we'll obviously let you know once the decision is made, how we were moving forward and how that'll be communicated out. So with that, um, we'll turn it over to Rich to do some highlights and some reminders on the rules. Uh, what I will say is there's been no rule changes um, since 2020. So those rules are still up in um ready to go for this year no no updates as far as any changes so hey, steve uh, yeah. before you hand it off to to rich uh in case folks aren't aware do you want to uh share with everyone the honor and uh prestige of the individual we have amongst us uh from uh usa games yeah i will um rich it was um i believe a coach for team maryland for uh, the USA Games in 2014, I know for sure 2018, um, and then he applied to be what they call the technical delegate or an assistant technical delegate, if you will, um, for um, USA Games uh, in Orlando uh, this past USA Games. Um, applied, um, interviewed, was um, um, asked to uh, take that on that role and then again after receiving that title in that role then he also found out I think a couple of weeks or a week before the event started in Orlando that his sport manager on site decided they were not going to continue um, so Rich had its hands full but it was a distinct honor for Special Mix Maryland to have Rich represent Maryland um, at the USA Games as the head bowling uh, venue director so um, again, kudos to Rich. Pleasure to have you continue your operations and your expertise with us here. And I think there's a possibility he may be considering official in World Games coming up. So we'll see about that. So without further ado, I now hand it over to our very own Rich Domros. Thank you. And uh, good evening, everybody. As they stated, the bowling rules are pretty much the same that we've had for the past couple of years. There haven't been any changes. So I won't go into them too deep because if you've been around any length of time, you've seen them all. Um, we're going to have at the tournaments, a singles tournament or a singles division, traditional doubles, um, two athletes to a team, and then again, the unifieds. 
Uh, ramp owners will be divisioned with the, and compete with the regular teams at the event. They won't be divisioned by themselves. Um, that's worked well in the past. And I think it's a, it's a better competition for our athletes. Um, assistant ramp bowlers must have a, uh, a, dealt, a designated bowling assistant, which means somebody that's been working with them for a while has been put into GMS um, and knows the rules or is at least familiar with them, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later, uh, because without following those rules, there's a chance that they could be disqualified and we don't like to do that. All right, next slide, Steve. Yeah, and Rich, and I, and I apologize. When we were going up on one of the designated slides and we talked about requirements, just remember that a ramp assistant is has the same certification and needs as a sport volunteer, okay? So just want to make that clear. All right, moving on. There you go. Back to you, Rich. All right, handicap will be based on 100% of the difference of the bowler's average in 200. To make that real easy for anybody who is new, I see there's a couple of names I don't recognize, but I don't see your faces, so I'm not sure. If, it, if a bowler has an average of 100, uh, their handicap would be 100. So they get 100% of the difference. If they have an average of 150, they get 50 pen. And what that does is it makes competition pretty much exactly even for anybody with under a 200 average, regardless of how we division them. The number of games at the regional and states will be three games. Um, and if your athletes are only practicing two games, as in Montgomery County, we do a lot of two games and then we throw a few three games in there to get our athletes used to it. Um, make sure that they are prepared to both three games the day of the regional and the state competition. We'll be alternating lanes, which we call league play, which if you're bowling on lanes one and two, the athletes will bowl on both lanes one and two. If they start on lane one for frame one, lane two, they'll be bowling on lane two. Um, I found out at the uh, USA games that some athletes were not used to that and didn't know about it. So it was kind of a surprise and it's a good thing we had a preliminary day for them to get used to it before the competition. Uh, if there's a reason that we need to um, switch it so that a, an athlete will be bowling on one lane. I have not seen that in my experience so far with Special Olympics Maryland at my sites, um, but perhaps it's happened in other places. That will be done in extraordinary circumstances, but uh, I don't foresee us having to do that. It Rich, the, uh, the very <coughs> rare times, it was an equipment issue. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, it's getting choked up here. Huh. Yeah. I didn't realize I was that good, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> fouls, fouls, the foul lines will be on for both the regional and the state tournaments. Fouls can be called by, called by the automatic uh, foul detection device and or a tournament official or a lane monitor. Um, if an athlete crosses the foul line, falls over the foul line, et cetera, uh, if you have any experience with polling, you know what that is. Once they cross after while delivering the ball, um, it will count as a zero for that throw. If it's the first ball, they do get the second one, but any pins they knock down will be set back up uh, a full rack for the second ball. Bumpers on the side of the bowling alley. Um, the way I stated it, when I first started coaching Special Olympics bowling and I saw that the bumpers were up, I said, if you need bumpers, you don't need coaches. So uh, it has to be the athlete's ability, not the 57 hits on the bumpers. So if your athletes practice with bumpers, um, I would highly suggest you get them practicing without them because their average for the 15 games cannot be, uh, part of it cannot be using bumpers. They all have to be regularly thrown balls. Lane courtesy is a pet peeve of a lot of people, including in my county. Um, we, we try often and regularly to remind athletes to look to the left, look to the right, and give the courtesy of having the bowlers that are next to you throwing their ball without you going up at the same time. You should, uh, the bowlers should remain um, kind of behind the ball return uh, in the approach area while the other athlete is getting ready to throw their ball. 
as soon as they begin their approach and deliver their ball, then they can move forward. I know our athletes just can't wait to get up there to let that ball go. Um, and sometimes it's a, it's a little difficult with some of our bowlers that take a little bit longer in setting up. The other athletes get a little excited, uh, waiting and waiting and waiting. But, uh, you know, please teach lane courtesy in your practices uh, so that we have a little more of it going on at the tournaments. Next slide, Steve. Alternates, a bowler who's registered for singles may also be registered as an alternate for a doubles event. Alternates do not have to be assigned to a specific team. Participants are eligible to, uh, as an alternate, if registered as such for the comp by the competition deadline. Activation of alternates will be declared by the head of the delegation during the registration period upon arrival. Bowlers may only compete in one event. Uh, for example, they cannot roll both singles and serve as an alternate in doubles, uh, most likely because it's very difficult. Uh, both activities are generally going on at the same time and they can't bowl on two different lanes at the same time. If a bowler is activated as an alternate for a doubles team at the regional tournament, uh, that bowler may only advance to the state tournament as a member of a doubles team, uh, the one that they've committed to. They can't bounce back to uh, a singles position. Coaching is not permitted in the bowling lane area. Uh, generally, the area down where the bowlers sit, the ball return, uh, or it's, it's a, usually the wooded area, it, the score tables are there. Coaches can provide coaching advice from the spectators area, which means uh, there's normally some sort of visible or uh, divider of sorts at many, many lanes where the coaches would need to stay back in the spectator area and call their athletes up after they finish a frame. Uh, you cannot have conversations with your athlete between the first and second ball of a frame, all right? Um, and you may not delay the game in any way, shape or form by providing information to them. Ramp assistance. Bowling ramps may be used for bowlers who do not have the physical ability to roll a ball with their hands or without the use of a ramp. Uh, the athletes must provide the force used uh, to make the ball go down the ramp. The athlete has to touch the ball and give it a push. All right, uh, I mean, that cannot be done by the ramp assistant. Um, the ramp can be set either by the athlete. Some athletes have the ability to make the adjustments to the ramps themselves or at the direction from the athlete by the ramp assistant. What that would mean is if the athlete can't physically adjust the ramp, uh, they must either verbally or pointing one way or pointing the other, tell the assistant which direction they want the ramp move. Now, mind you, when the assistant puts the ramp up uh, before the first ball is rolled, they grab the ramp, they put it up in the general center of the, of the lane, but the assistant at that point, what I see, which will get people disqualified, is once they grab the ramp and they start doing this, looking down the lanes, that's an issue. That has to be done at the direction or by the ability of the athletes themselves. Again, it must be the athlete's ability that gets them their score during the competition, and it should be during their practice. Um, to move them onto the regional or state games. Some athletes may not have that ability and they practice in your county programs, which is great. And we, we have a few of them and we absolutely love them. They have a great time. We just realize that they are not ready to move on to the, uh, to the regional and state tournaments uh, because they don't have the either communication skills or physical abilities for the ramp directing. The bowling assistant typically will have their back uh, to the pins while setting the ramp. Um, normally, what the way I teach it is when you take the ramp up there and your athlete is coming up, you're kind of at a 90 degree angle or you're facing the athlete instead of looking down the ramp or at the pins. It's when the, it's when the assistant starts looking down the ramp and at the pins, uh, we run into some difficulties with saying that it was the athlete's um, abilities or directions of aiming the ramp. If you guys have any ramp assistance that have questions on this, please reach out to me 
and uh, I will be glad to talk to them and, and, and walk them through it. Or if you come to the coaches training on August 20th, um, we demonstrate that during the coaches training for bowling coaches. With, yeah, okay, we're good. Um, with the athlete or with the ramp assistant, just go back a second, Steve, the bottom, the bottom one. Um, in extremely rare, rare situations, and it must be approved in advance, um, that an assistant will face or to towards the pins or, or, or look that way. Um, this is a modification from Special Olympics Maryland. Um, and generally it's on a very rare rare occasion i haven't seen us have to use that but uh, most of the times we, we do our best to work around it to keep the athletes from getting disqualified okay thanks they to adhere to all of the gibberish i just gave you regarding the ramp assistance um and and i, I apologize for spending so much time on this We've had to disqualify people a few times over the past couple of years. I hate it when we have to do it, um, but in all fairness, it, it has to be the athlete's ability. Um, bowling assistants must meet all the same requirements as any other bowling volunteer. Remember it was mentioned that they are a sports volunteer and concussion training um, is required as a sports volunteer because they are physically on the lanes. If an athlete of bowls with a ramp assistant uh, attends an event without their assigned ramp assistant from their area or county program, the athlete will be disqualified and will be allowed to bowl for participation ribbon only. Attire. We beat this to death at every competition. Um, appropriate attire is required. All right. And participants, including the bowling assistants and rap assistants, um, without proper uniform can be disqualified and not allowed to participate or allowed on the lanes for any reason. All attire must be clean and neat. When I read this the other day, Steve, I made it as a run on sentence and it, it was much more funnier. Attire must be neat, clean, torn, dirty, and frayed. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> You got to put the paws in the right place. The tire must be clean and neat. Torn, dirty, or frayed clothing is unacceptable. Collared shirts must be worn, and shirts do not have to be tucked in. Um, all competitors must wear bowling shoes, and bowling shoes should not be worn outside of the venue. Obviously, if it's raining outside, you pick up stones, it causes some issues with the, the approach. Bowling shoes are made of special soles so that they can slide when they release the ball. Um, and the bowling shoes need to stay clean and dry on the underside of them. Um, hats and headwear. No hats or headless rim or rimless headwear will be permitted. Headphones are not permitted for bowling tournaments. Athletes who experience noise concerns are permitted to wear small earbuds. All right, I know some athletes like to wear hats, uh, baseball hats or whatnot during your practices. I have them as well. Um, you know, when it comes to the tournaments, they can't wear it. During our practices, our athletes a couple of years ago started to wear headphones and earbuds. And uh, we actually made them stop wearing them during practices um, because they're there for a sport. They're not there to listen to their favorite music. Next Mike, I, Mike, I saw you unmute yourself. Did you have a comment? Uh, no, just um, uh, George Hale uh, put a question in uh, that uh, it's actually, I think, applies to an earlier slide. Can a unified partner also be the ramp assistant for their uh, athlete with whom they've partnered? I don't see why not. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think just to clarify, George, I, I think I know what you're saying is um, if a partner, if they're in unified doubles and a unified partner, or for that matter, a traditional athlete, is in doubles with another athlete they obviously can bowl their own balls and then serve as the ramp assistant for the athlete um again a good question i don't think we i've ever uh, ha had that question in the past but um i don't see any reason why we would say no to that george no again just make sure that 
I was, you know, if it's whoever the ramp assistant is that they know how to do that and they abide by all the instruction that or or all the the three slides that we talked about with the assistant ramp. Um, so, but good question, George. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, that comes up in our county because Mike and Michelle bowl together and Michelle is a ramp bowler. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I, I think um, there's a way to put that into the um, the comment section when we enter into GMS. But when you do your registrations, um, just reach out to me um, and let's make sure that we indicate that properly in the in the system. And next slide, Steve. Good deal. Back to you, Rich. All right, your slats or pants, pants or shorts. Um, similar to Dockers type plant pants. A lot of people start thinking that you must wear Dockers. No, you do not have to wear Dockers, but I think everybody knows what Dockers kind of look like. Uh, generally, they're a cotton or synthetic material uh, type pants. All right, inappropriate slacks, pants, shorts um, include but are not limited to cut off shorts, shorts over three inches above the kneecap, jeans, sweatpants, exercise pants including those that are gathered or have stirrups at the bottoms, leggings, spandex, or other form of pants that uh, people wear for biking or tight shorts, boxer shorts, shorts that look like boxer shorts, um, worn as outerwear, um, clothing that allow under garments to be exposed. Pretty much um, if, it, if it's an athletic type short and not a uh, doctor's type dress short, um, it's, it's going to be an issue. So make sure you check your athletes uh, slacks or shorts um, ahead of time, because once you get to the bowling alley and they're wearing jeans, they're not going to be allowed to bowl. Okay. Or jeans or other inappropriate attire. Uh, we have a uniform check. I know we do that at our house for the regional games and for the state tournament. And I think one of the things here, I, I think we had one or new one or two new coaches. Just to reiterate, the the purpose and the reasoning behind this is number one to respect the sport and the rules, to look professional, and to have respect as an organization and the athletes. And you know, I, I've seen other times, not here in Maryland, but other locations or other Special Olympics where um, they're very uh, slacking in some situations regarding the uniform requirements, and then when they implement the uniform requirements, the athlete's demeanor rises up. They feel important, they feel respected and dignified that I have a proper uniform. I'm not just wearing my scrunchies or whatever. Um, so again, it's it's to respect the organization, to respect the sport and to respect the competitors. So with that, um, again, um, Really think we've got a lot of great coaches here, a lot of experience, and then I uh, think a few new ones. So welcome to the new coaches. Hopefully um, your area of leadership has put you in a successful situation to help out. Um, we do have our coaches resource page. Once again, um, if you just Google Special Olympics Maryland, there's a tab up at the top that says coach. Um, you hit coach, there's a little drop down. It says coach resources. You click on that. And that'll take you into where a lot of forms and a lot of information is. And you scroll down, scroll down, and then you'll get to some of the sports specific pages, bowling being one of those. Hey, but Steve. Just, yeah. Uh, one thing that I, I didn't remember if it was in here or not, the, the bowling specific training coming up. Uh, were you going to mention that before we shut down? Uh, good, good point, Rich. Yeah, we have sent that out. But if you want to do another plug and the location and time of that down in Gaithersburg, that'd be great. Okay, um, if you have any new coaches or, or coaches who have not had their sports specific uh, training for bowling, um, I'm going to be running a session on August 20th from 12 to 2.30 at Bowl America in Gaithersburg. With that training, that'll restart the clock on your three years, um, or if anybody who hasn't had it yet, it will, it will help getting your sports certification. It's a, um, it's a very good uh, basic program that I like to put on. And I've got to tell you, even though I say it's basic, every time I teach it, I remember stuff that I forgot. Um, so please, if, the, if you need somebody to sign up, again, that's on August 20th. It's a Saturday from 12 to 2.30 at Gaithersburg. 
And, and we'll send a reminder out when we send the slide deck and everything else. There's a sign up on, I think it's through Survey Monkey Mike or some other form of signing up for that. Uh, yes, I believe that's already uh, out there for that. Yeah. Uh, we do have a question from Gene Reams um, asking if uh, a local program is allowed to require masks. You are certainly allowed to encourage folks to wear masks, but no, you are not um, allowed to require them. Um, similarly, you can't require vaccinations because that's our our standard going forward there. can certainly, though, encourage folks to do that. The only requirement, if you want to say that, for requiring masks is if someone is returning after having tested positive, and that's part of that protocol um, that's in place for that. Yeah. So. One of the other things, I'll, I'll put another uh, pitch in for the coaching um, training that, that Rich will be conducting on the 20th. Um, if you have signed up or you go, if you are going to sign up, um, you can definitely email me um, and make sure you get a response, even if it's just, thanks, got it. Um, for any specific questions you may have, um, Rich has the standard um, good coaches training, but if there are some things that you need clarification on, whether it's a rule or whether it's a challenge you have with your training or an athlete or a certain skill set, um, let us know. That way we can address that at the coaches training. Um, we're always looking for ways to um, enhance you and your experience um, during the coaches trainings to address specific issues you may have. And I'm sure if you're having those, other coaches have also experienced that or had it as well. So again, it's just a helpful hint instead of at the coaches training, oh, I, I have a question, let's talk about this. If we have it in advance, Rich can take some time to, to look at addressing it and making it available and, and more uh, time um, put into answering the question or addressing those issues. So we would appreciate your, your help and, and proactiveness on that as well. Um, so again, this is the link. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought you were you were closing out. I did have a follow up question here to answer. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll hit these just as a reminder. This is the link that takes you directly to the bowling portion of the coaches page. For anybody who um, for the fall season and through uh, ten pin bowling, these are the sports directors and their respective sports that they oversee. Currently, um, I am. I should have put kayaking on here too. Kayaking is time trials this weekend and then finals next week or the 20th. Yeah. Um, but currently, as we look to fill one of our sports directors position, I'm currently filling in um, as the interim person overseeing cycling, bowling and some other sports. But for the fall season, um, these are the two sports that I'll be overseeing. So bowling, I'm your contact for now until you're told otherwise. So um, and Mike, you want to go ahead with your follow-up question? Sure. Okay. So um, uh, the question is, um, I think this is a follow-on to the requirement for masks. Uh, my response to the requirement for masks is, can an, can an area program or a bowling program on their own say everyone needs to wear masks? And the answer to that is no. Now, if the state of Maryland implements a mask requirement or a county government does so, or a facility that you're in, that utilizes it, um, you know, things um, spike and, and they decide to do that, then again, we will follow whatever the most restrictive uh, situation is there. At this point, there are no mask mandates by the state or county governments. I mean, facilities are gonna make their own choice with that. Um, but in terms of, uh, there, there's a reference to being red for COVID. Uh, again, we are not following the, um, uh, the Special Olympics um, color coding uh, uh, options, and we're not the only state who has made a shift. The Special Olympics process and um, uh, and uh, protocol uh, related to that is a is a worldwide one, and uh, we think uh, where we're at. Uh, yeah, Mike, not... this is Tony. I, I I said red, but I actually meant high. Mm -hmm. so, so again, so the CDC by... I know uses low, medium, and high. Sure. So if the, but again, we're following in terms of any of these, uh, if the state government or a county government or the facility implements uh, a requirement as that, uh, then we of course would follow that in that situation. Again, anyone who wishes to wear a mask certainly can do so. Um, there, no one will be in any way, shape or form prohibited. But what we can't do is mandate that unless it, based on our uh, how we're operating now, 
again, something could change. I don't anticipate it, but it's possible. Um, but um, um, you know, no, no program or or whatever um, would implement that other than if again it's the state government or county government or I guess you could have a municipality that has their own um, um, set of rules as well uh, or the facility. Good. Thank you, Mike. Um, one thing I do want to point out, in case someone is also a coach for golf, powerlifting, or long distance running and wrote down Ryan Kelchner's email, there's a typo there. I will correct that before the slide goes out. Um, but typically, so everyone knows, if you haven't figured it out or you're new, um, typically the email addresses for the staff here at the state office are their first initial, last name, at S for special, O for Olympics, M for Maryland, D for David, dot org. So I just saw that, and if, I just want to mention that in case somebody's a coach for one of those other sports and wrote Ryan's email address down, um, his email address is r-k-e-l-c-h-n-e-r -E -E at somd.org. So um, with that being said, <clears throat> here is the section I was talking about with all the resources. Um, it's just as a reference, you can go through here at your leisure. Um, it gives you information, a couple more grids, um, some websites, talks about the codes of conduct. Um, it gives you examples of the incident report forms, the medical forms for the athletes. Um, I believe there may be a CDW, if, if not, um, that is on our coaches resource page, the volunteer applications. Um, so again, just know that this information is here for you to um, use as a reference um, if and when needed. And also, at, we're always here to help you guys and support you guys. Um, always look at the coach's resource page before you send in an email. Um, we find it saves you guys time. It saves us some time and energy as well. Um, and if you find something that you're looking for in the coach's resource page and it's not there or you searched for 20 minutes and couldn't find it, let us know. It may be something that we've overlooked and we will add to the coach's resource page or maybe move it to a more visible area. Um, so always looking for feedback from you guys with that as well. Um, with that being said, I think we said the webinar would be from 6.30 to 8. Um, I don't see or have heard of any other questions coming in. So as we see if there's any questions coming in right now, I do want to take this time and opportunity to, number one, um, thank Rich for joining tonight and, and leading us through the rules section and his continued dedication to host um, the coaches trainings for you guys as coaches. I also want to thank uh, Mike for coming on in support of this webinar. But most importantly, I want to thank each and every one of you guys as coaches um, for the dedication and leadership you provide to the athletes and the, and the partners um, within your program, um, your dedication um, for submitting or spending the time to do the proper training, providing the opportunities for the athletes to get out and enjoy the sport of bowling, um, we're here to support you in that endeavor, but without you, Special Olympics doesn't happen. You guys are the ones working with the athletes, preparing them for competitions, preparing them for the training, setting them up for successes to showcase their skills when they get out on the lanes locally, regionally, state level, um, national level, world level, etc. cetera. So um, just want to thank you guys so much um, for what you do for the athletes, uh, Special Olympics Maryland, and the movement. So continue the great efforts. We're here if you have any questions. Don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And with that, I wish you all a very pleasant weekend. And I know I'm going to see some of you guys this weekend at Kayaking Time Trials. And Tony, we'll see where we, uh, if you're nice to me, I may give you a good volunteer opportunity. If not, we may put you on um, something not so pleasant. <laughs> Oh, it, it doesn't matter. I'm going to bring Stormy because he needs some volunteer hours. He just don't know it yet. <laughs> ah, gotcha. Very good, my friend. Look forward to seeing you and Stormy and anybody else attending the time trials. Um, this yeah, Saturday. we're coming next week. We're not going to make it this week, but next week. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, the time trials are down in Chestertown at Washington College yeah. at the Boathouse on the 13th. And then the finals are the following Saturday on the 20th, same location in Chestertown. So good evening, everyone. Thank you very much.